perfect. Salute, 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 and welcome. Welcome back to the Black Ocean. And now swimming in the deep end with your host, the one and only great Black Shark. And yes, family, I told you we was going to take a trip down memory lane. We're going to have to examine this Susan Smith case now. A lot of you may say, well, GBS, this is old news. Why are you bringing this back up? Well, it's very relevant because, as you all know, if you thought my previous broadcast, I covered how the white supremacists were celebrating and still celebrating the passing of OJ Simpson. And no one said the man was perfect. Nobody said he was a hero. You know, they'll pull that crap talking about who we make heroes of when it comes to George Floyd, OJ Simpson, whoever, but see, we're going to examine this Susan Smith case here tonight because since they're so up in arms and they're so self-righteous about Defending life and protecting life. Well, we're going to look at some of their most degenerate. That's exactly what this Children of the Chalk series is. And it's going to be perpetually ongoing since the white supremacists wanted to get my attention during Black History Month. That's how this series came about. So I'm going to give them all the attention that they need with nothing but truth about the history that they don't like to talk about. Oh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, because, see, there's a lot of important lessons to be learned from examining this, not just for those of us that remember it, but for our young people that this happened before their time so that they understand the correlation, as I always say, between history and present day. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing over here tonight. And I saw the, the case, thanks to the good sister, Mrs. L, that sent me the information on that horrible murder case of the young sister, Shade Robinson. I'm going to be covering that. In an upcoming broadcast, because there's some there's some things I'm gonna have to point out about that. I don't know if a lot of other people are really gonna touch on the things that I'm gonna say, but even if they don't, I'll take care of that because that's a life or death situation that affects more than just the family of the sister Shade Robinson. I'm, I'm gonna have to really drill down on this particular issue because Yes, we want the white supremacists that murdered Shade Robinson to get justice. But see, I'm going to tell you what led up to that, too, in, in the broadcast, because it's something I feel a lot of people don't go hard enough in the paint on. But I'm going to take care of that in that upcoming broadcast. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. Not everybody knows what the gist of tonight's broadcast is going to be. Let me make sure I scroll up and greet a esteemed guest that will be joining us over here tonight. I see in the building. I see Tony in the building to stay woke. I see Willie Tresses joining us over here. I see Stolen Ancestors 1526. The good sister Mrs. L in the building. I see Patricia Jenkins. I see Netta J in the house. Let's see. Go down. I see Seven Skills in here. The young brother Josh Norris. Nightfall Drop is in here. Only Pamela's Way. Excuse me. I see Opal Ivy in the building. CRU Reality. 
And that's all I see so far. But Sun Kiss uh, TMH in the building. Welcome to all of you and anybody else that'll be joining us in attendance here tonight. So, family, we're going to go ahead and get straight to brass tacks on this because there's some important things that need to be brought back up. Not just for those of us that are older, like I said, but for the young people, because the if we are going to be honest, this is the most integrated generation to ever exist in this country. OK, you know, a lot. whether you're talking about Gen Z, they, they grew up. This generation have always had the Internet and modern technology in their lives where a lot of us did not have access to these types of things that they have now. Information at the touch of a button. But here's the thing. The white supremacist main thing, the reason why they're trying to take history out of school books and rewrite history as we know it, they want to leave our youth vulnerable. And see, let me tell you who's at fault for that. If we don't do the teaching, that's our fault. And particularly if you're a black parent, that's your fault. If you don't make sure your black children understand that this system of racism and white supremacy is targeting them and the easiest target in a system of racism and white supremacy where you are the main target is if you're out in that system unaware and you thinking that everything is everything, everybody's cool, everything's cool by you and then you being set up, okay? So knowledge is power, and it becomes power when you apply that knowledge, so it becomes wisdom, okay? And we must continue to spread wisdom amongst our people. So before we get into that, I'm going to tell you something. I got to show y'all something because, see, what the white supremacists are dealing with me, they don't understand. I'm a very strategic man. I don't do or say anything. And salute to good, the good brother Kier. It was for the cash app. I don't do or say anything without a specific purpose or rhyme or reason to it. Even though the white supremacists don't catch it, even though some of our own people don't catch it. If you follow me on X, I'm going to put a link to this in the chat room. And, I, and I'm doing this for a reason because I may do this again as we get more people in here because it's something that I want you all to study. Okay. I'm going to see if it's going to let me put this tweet in here. Let me roll up here, see if I can put it in here. And you know what? It's a bit too big for me to put in here. They won't let me, but I'll tell you what. You saw it on my community tab. I'll tell you what. We'll do it this way. The tweet on my community tab about Caitlin, the ringless wonder, Clark. Okay. The mayonnaise maggots have lost their mind. The mediocre mayonnaise maggots, they lost their minds. But see, let me tell you why I posted that tweet. Because I knew they were going to pounce all over it. But what I said in that tweet, the statement I made, I stand on it because history has proven that. But see, this is what I want you all to do. Don't go into the comment section arguing back and forth with them. That is not the purpose of me posting that. I keep telling people that is a waste of time. When I post a tweet, let me make this clear because, see, this is something that black people are going to have to learn. When I post those tweets, what I'm looking for are their responses because, see, let, let me let me break this down to y'all. And I want y'all to pay t- attention to this before we get into tonight's uh, digest here. Dave Chappelle made the statement that Twitter isn't a real place. Okay. Literally, yes, it's a cyberspace platform. Here's the uh, the problem about people taking that literally, though. And I want y'all to pay attention to this because here's the flaw in people taking that literally. Yes, it's a cyberspace platform, but it's used by real people that have no problem saying what they really mean due to them thinking they have a sense of anonymity. So the Twitter isn't a real place thing. Make sure you keep that in its proper context. It is a very valuable study tool. Because, see, the white supremacists are cowards, and when they feel that they have some anonymity, they say they let it all hang out. You better believe that they mean every damn thing that they say on these platforms, okay? So now I'm going to read you the tweet. I see it because I posted what it was talking about. You know, it was a, a clip that I posted of Caitlin, the ringless wonder Clark, okay, on Saturday Night Live. Now... Let me show you how stupid they are when it comes to me, because you'll never see me going back and forth with them. That's not the purpose. They think that, you know, they come in with their all little white supremacist trolling. Oh, cry more. She was on Saturday Night Live. They're actually stupid enough to believe that the purpose of me posting that was about Saturday Night Live. No, it wasn't. I'm going to read this tweet. This is exactly why the dominant society isn't respected on the global stage today. 
They reward losers and gaslight as if they're on par with winners. Caitlin Clark has won no championships. You know who has? Angel, the champ, Reese. Oh, boy, they got their little alabaster, dirty drawers and panties in a bunch. I'm talking about, man, let me tell you how mad they were, boy, because all you got to do is go in the comment section. They were so damn mad that they told the lice to get to work attacking. Everything and their mama came out tweeting, and it is so pathetic. Let, let me tell you why, why I'm saying it's important for you to study that tweet on my community tab. I put the link to it in there. And see, that's another thing, too. I want to make sure I, I say this to everybody. Because there's a handful of people that probably knew here and some people that probably just, you know, they grew up looking at coloring books and they didn't really read a lot. Anything that I post that you see a picture to, if you click the read more part, there's a link to what I put. So for those people, I don't ever just post something without a link to something. OK, I hope we're clear on that. But see, what you need to take away from studying that comment section Family, this is why I tell you all, those, especially those of our lineage, Foundation of Black American Freedmen, don't you ever let these people make you feel inferior or talk to you about their high cues. Because clearly, Caitlin Clark won no rings. I never mind her individual achievements because, see, there's been plenty of players on plenty of team sports that had great individual achievements. The mark of a great player is leading the team to a victory. A collective victory, not just individual accomplishment. So they're so desperate to put this little John Cena face heifer. And I'm going here. I ain't on that all take the high road bullshit. Y'all can go to hell with that for the people that do that shit. Because you got a lot of Negroes that, well, you ain't going to talk about it. Look, fuck you. I am. I'm talking about the little stone face heifer. And she's a loser stone face heifer at that. Damn, that's double bad. They are so desperate to put this woman and her mediocrity um, on par and make her an honorary winner. Just hand her a little participation trophy. Let me tell you why it's premise of something. This is why time is running out for you because, see, a wise people looks at things on any battlefield as they really are, not how you wish they were. This is why they can't survive without a system of unearned benefits. They have to cheat in order to be able to compete. And then a lot of times when they cheat, they still lose. Look at Tyson Fury. Even though Naganu is, I think I'll pronounce his name right, he's not LBA. But look how Tyson Fury had to cheat in that fight. I could go on and on about situations where it's competition. They can't win straight up and down. They can't do it. And I'm, I'm, I'm applying this. See, it's bigger than sports, too. That's the other thing that these goofy white supremacists don't understand. They fall for it every time because, see, what I like to do, I like to, this is why I don't want anybody's platform censored. I like the white supremacists to be free to speak their mind so that you all can go and study them, not go back and forth with them. Because, see, I see some brothers doing it, but I'm saying this particularly to you sisters because, like, y'all get all riled up in your most. Let me get them told. Let me ask you a question. After you get them told, what's that accomplished if you didn't learn anything from them? Let them do the own, their own talking and just sometimes practice this because I, I want y'all to hear me out. This is important. Practice when you go into something before you start typing and trying to go back and forth with them. Practice, just look at what they're saying. Look at what they're saying, okay? These people are pathetic and weak. If they did not have a system of white supremacy, they would have been done a long time ago. And if you don't believe me, i tell you what. Go study that tweet on my community tab. Go look at it. And, and, when, and I not the reply, just the look. And then when you see the stuff that they're saying, I mean, it's crazy. See, that's one thing about black folks. If we compete at something and we lose, we accept that. We're like, okay, hey, we, man, better luck next time. We lost. We don't try to turn a loss into a damn victory. You never see us doing that. And see, here's the other thing that I, I want to teach you how to strategically analyze these types of tweets. It's white supremacists. Both conservative and liberal, by the way, because, you know, those terms don't really mean a damn thing. They try to come over and try to play that game. And you have the tether class joining in trying to get brownie points. See, you need to learn how to study things like that so you can gather intelligence on your adversaries. Because, I mean, I was laughing at the stuff they were saying. They, they thought that angers me. That doesn't upset me. I'm laughing at them because I'm like, you're doing exactly what I wanted you to do. I want you to show my people what you really are uninhibited. And this is absolutely pathetic. 
to sit there and try to put up a just think about how pathetic they are. See, nobody really tells them what I'm saying, the way I'm saying it. Do you know how abysmally pathetic you have to be to try to hold up a damn loser as if they're a winner? Family, you apply that to them across the board throughout history, and, and now you see why those like myself really don't have no respect and damn sure no fear for no white supremacists. These are cowards. The only thing that they have going for them is their system. Without that, it's game over. And the universe is correcting that mistake as we speak. This is exactly why it's going to end badly for them because, see, you would think that people with such high IQs they will actually look at things and say, okay, if we're not actually winning, we need to go and work on our skill set and then come back and compete to win. See, there's a difference between people that are actually real competitors and warriors. At the end of the day, if you're a true competitor and a warrior with any sense of honor to yourself, if somebody just handed you a participation trophy, your spirit wouldn't let you sleep. You wouldn't be able to do that. This is why these people have far less stronger constitutions than us. Let's take it completely away from sports. And we're going to get into tonight's broadcast, but I got to go ahead and get this off because most people will not tell them the truth the way I will. Go and look at hardships they've had to face, like the Great Depression, et cetera, et cetera. As soon as things got bad, these people were killing themselves and their families. Black folks in this country always had to deal with hardship. We'd be like, okay, as long as we're breathing, we'll figure out how to make a way. Don't you ever let these people make you think there's something to be looked up to or that they're any smarter or stronger than us. This is absolutely pathetic. And see, before I close on this, the ultimate thing that had me dying of laughter, they kept talking about, well, she's the number one draft pick in the WNBA. And I said, the, 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 look, some of y'all already know I'm going with this. That makes it even more funny because it underscores my point. You reward mediocrity. See, that is not merit-based. How in the hell are you going to make her the number one draft pick when she never led her team to a championship at all? Don't have no rings. She's the number one draft pick, though. Oh, my God, family. I'm going to tell you, if I ever decide to do a broadcast on that, boy, I'm going to hurt their feelings in so many ways. I'm going to hurt their feelings in so many ways. And see, let, let me say this to the Sambos that's on there. Oh, Caitlin Clark is the best thing in sliced bread bandwagon. You pathetic clowns, I'm glad you're speaking up too because, see, family, let me tell you something. I want you to remember every Sambo and Sam Bit that's doing that, I want you to remember them because, see, these are the people that are always seeking to get validation and brownie points from the dominant society, and those are the ones that you have to watch out for the most, okay? So I just had to go ahead and get that part off my chest because, see, it was very necessary. You study that tweet and study it the way I, I asked you to, and you'll learn and take notes on some of the stuff they're saying. The extreme windmilling that they're doing to prop that loser up. Absolutely pathetic. It's, it's funny to me. Because they actually thought the little stuff they were saying was getting me mad. I'm like, no, nah, you're doing exactly what I need you to do. Thank you, white supremacists. I love when you provide me the necessary tools to educate my people properly. So now we're going to get into these children of the chalk here. Let me give my disclaimer before I do so. This is going to be a very... Offensive broadcast to any mother that loves her children. If you are a young black person that has never heard of what I'm about to present to you, well, I can understand if you skip over this broadcast tonight and you don't want to see this. I can understand that because I, I have to go into extreme detail about this because, see, the dangerous part of this, and I put this in the chat room on my last broadcast covering the O.J. Simpson situation. Let me put a link to this article in the chat room because I want y'all to have this for reference. Okay? We'll put this in here three times. I'll probably put it in here again as the broadcast goes on because I want you to be able to study what happened here. See, you have to teach your black children about these types of things because this demonic, filthy, disgusting demon Killed her children, and as you see, the Washington Post says she captivated the nation by saying a black man kidnapped her son's police knew she killed him. Now, let me teach young black people something about this article that you're looking at, okay? When a black person does something, their name is highlighted immediately in, in the 
the main quotes of it, the, the beginning quotes of it, uh, an article. Notice what, and I want y'all to pay attention to this pattern because see, pattern recognition is very important when you're a black person in a system of white supremacy as we are. Notice the different articles when a white person commits an egregious crime, they'll mention their name, but it'll be the way later down in the article. When a black person does it, your name is front and center in bold italics, okay? Because see, they, they should have said Susan Smith captivated the nation. That just she. Who is she? Don't worry. We're going we to talk about she tonight. Oh, we're we going to introduce my people to she. Because some of you remember this, but some young black people may not. So we're going to go ahead and start examining this. And we're going to be breaking it down to review certain things that happen at this time. Because see, mind you, this is why new black media is important. And this is why those like myself choose to use my platform for more than just clowning around and trying to be a damn buffoon all the time. Like some of these idiots like Kai Sinat and the rest of them do. We choose to use this platform as a counter mechanism to the propaganda because during the 90s and before that, you didn't have a way to immediately fact check and debunk the lying mainstream media, or as we like to call it, the Mayo Street media. We're going to get to doing that over here tonight. So with that said, family, we're going to go ahead and get started. We'll be stopping this as need be. I want to say to my babies <laughs> that your mama loves you so much. And your daddy, these whole families love you so much. <laughs> and you guys have got to be strong. Susan and David Smith of Union, South Carolina, appear on local TV to appeal for the safe return of their two missing children. Three-year-old Michael and 14-month-old Alex. The police, the public, and the press join a county-wide search for the missing children who, according to Susan, have been abducted by a carjacker. Now, I'm going to go ahead and get started working on this right now, because, see, for you young black people that are listening, and I know I have a lot more out of the blue. That surprised me. A lot more younger people are listening to this uh, platform over here. So I feel that I have to make sure I'm responsible in the way I report things. So I want you to take a good look at the sketch. Because as I showed you in the article there and as the announcer just said and i put the link to it in chat i will put it in there even more times as the broadcast rolls on tonight look at this sketch because see here's where history and present day interconnect when you go back and look at black wall street that town was burnt down because of a white woman's lie similar situation in slocum texas we saw how Emmett Till lost his life. We saw how George Stinney Jr. lost his life. The youngest person to be electrocuted by electric chair at 14 years old over a white woman's lie. Okay, white supremacist woman's lie. We're going to call it what it is. This sketch right here, here's the danger for the young people that may not catch why this is such a big deal. Whichever black man that looked like that, don't you know these race soldiers were trying to find who this imaginary black man was that she made up here? And see, notice this. I'm going to thread another needle for you with the OJ case since they want to talk about OJ. See, I love to capitalize on any point that they give me to make. Remember how they kept talking about OJ during that trial? Oh, he was in the school cap, in the school cap. Now, look at this design. I'm going to show you where I'm going with this. This sketch that you're looking at, family, this is how the black boogeyman in every white person's head look. Got a stereotypical skull cap on, and this is it right here. You understand me? The problem with these white supremacist demons is when they tell these lies and just make up something, that puts a target on the backs of other innocent black men, okay? And, in, and women in some cases, and in some cases children, okay? So this is why we're going to be analyzing this and threading some needles with, while we're reviewing this case here tonight. Let's let it continue. Do not give up. I mean, these two little boys. I wanted anybody and everybody that, that would help look for him. But after a nine-day search for her sons, Susan Smith finally comes clean. There is no carjacker after all. She has killed her children. 
till the day I die, I firmly believe that Susan made a choice, a horrible, horrible choice. But she. Ch I'm going to pause it right here again. Now. Let me let me tell you something. One of the things that sets foundational black American freedmen and, and black people worldwide, really, if you want to be honest, apart from the white supremacists. We actually have some humanity and souls about us to actually look at this, even though these are little white children say they didn't deserve that. That was a demonic, horrible crime. Look at them. They're babies, man. These are little babies. See, the thing, the difference between us and them, we can look at any children and still see babies. They don't see babies when they look at our children, even of the same age. Black children that would be the same age and something horrible happens to them. They celebrate that. Look at how they celebrate Tamir Rice. You see what I'm saying? This is why we say the white supremacists, keyword, white supremacists are irredeemable. I'm going to say it yet again. As they go on to describe the horrific murder of these two little babies right here, you think about how scared they had to be when she did what she did. Hmm? You, you, I'm going gonna make, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna to go even further into detail that. All of us were children. You think back to when you were little, okay, your earliest memories. If somebody had did that to you, at the time when you didn't even really understand the world, just think how afraid you would be. And even worse to know that your mother did this to you. The person, one of the people that's supposed to be responsible for protecting you outside of your father. And that is the ultimate demonic betrayal. And I'm going to say it again like I did in the last broadcast where I was talking about OJ. You can't really call yourself a true white supremacist if you got the cape on for this helper. Like I showed y'all, there's people that want to actually marry this woman if she happens to make parole. And I'm going to keep my eye on that because if they let that demon back out, don't say that you believe in your little 14 words because you're supposed to be in those 14 words providing a future for white children. You would think that anybody that murders a white child, if you're a true white supremacist with your numbers dwindling, that would be a cardinal sin that there's no coming back from. I'm going to extend that to all your mass shooters that's running around killing up your own people, especially your kids. The children of any race are his future, okay? So I'm just saying, man, I, I've got, a, I've actually got some compassion and humanity to me to, to, to look at this for what it was and see that that's something, you know what? Here's the other thing. I'm going to put this out for the white supremacists. Another difference between them and us. If some black people would have saw that, we would have tried to stop that woman and save them children. We would have. I know my people. I know we would have because we would not want to see some children innocent. They hadn't done nothing to nobody killed in this manner. That's the difference between us and them. This is why I keep saying we're God's children. But see, this demon right here that killed these babies, oh, she's the furthest thing from one of God's children. I'm going to let this continue. I want y'all to listen to how they describe what she did. Shows herself over those kids. Why did Susan Smith murder her own flesh and blood? Why did she lie to the world about her crime? Not until her trial will the whole truth emerge, when a jury will decide if she lives or dies. Union lies in the heart of America's Bible Belt, South Carolina. The lifeblood of the town is textiles. Susan Lee Vaughan is born here in 1971, the youngest of three children. She is just 19 years old when she meets David Smith. Susan and I were working in a grocery store together in Union. Um, I was a stalker and she was a cashier. And we just got to talking at work and we enjoyed each other's company. We both liked to go out and enjoy the same things like amusement parks or um, listen to the same music and then started dating. They fall in love and on March the 15th, 1991, they marry. The following October, their first son Michael is born. But the marriage is heading for trouble. They both have affairs. They break up, get back together, then have another child they call Alex. Susan wants more than David can give her, but she never lets on. Thinking back now, I couldn't, I can't think of a single thing that, that would have been a sign of things that were to come. 
Now I'm gonna pause it right here and I'm gonna point out something that, you know, and, and look, we're reviewing. Uh, normally I wouldn't even speak on this because you know I normally cover cover what happens in our community. But since we're t- talking about what happened back then, I'm going to bring up something I normally would not say. You heard them say that the marriage was headed for trouble. They both had affairs. They broke up, got back together, and then decided to do the worst thing ever, which was have another child. See, if her husband, those children's father, would have been paying attention, instead of getting back with her to have another child, because, see, white men can do this if they want to. Let's be clear. It's not like the system with black men trying to get their children. If they fought, he fought for them kids. His child at the time, the one child before they had another, he could have got the child. And see, this is the other thing about why they, and I brought that tweet up with uh, Caitlin Clark for for a reason, because it ties into this, believe it or not. That delusion about themselves, always thinking that they're always so good, they're always so great when they're some of the most rotten beings on the planet. They often look at each other and ignore the psychological destability in each other to the point that they could be demonically insane and they just overlook it. See, I guarantee you that he started to see all types of signs, even though it said they both committed affairs, but he should have fought to get his kids and they will probably still be alive. You don't get back with somebody if you see things were so bad and then you go bring another life into that chaos. That was mistake number one right there. So I'm going to be looking at this from the standpoint for anybody listening, any man of any community, okay, which is a rarity for me to speak outside of our community and the black community, but for any man listening to this, if it didn't work out with you and, and your ex-wife, your baby mother, whatever, the last thing in the world you do is get back together and make another child. Don't do that. It didn't work out for a reason. Do not try to force a square pig in a round hole. And I'm saying that to the women listening of any community, too. Some things were just not meant to be, Okay. And the number one thing that you should never do, whether you're a man or a woman, is take that out on the children. The children didn't ask to be here. And see, the reason why this pisses me off so bad, this funky bitch, nobody aborted her, and I'm going to call her what she is, a funky bitch. That's where I reserve the term bitch for. I don't care who I use against. You killing kids and doing things to elderly people, stuff like that, yeah, you a bitch. And, And I use the term for male and female. Nobody killed her off her raggedy ass. She grew up to be a whole adult and bring children into the world. And then you turn around and take them out of this world. See, that's who there's a special place in hell for. Why they talking about OJ, who's innocent and didn't kill anybody. This bitch should be in hell right now. And I hope her life is a living hell behind them bars. Because, see, I'm going to keep an eye on whether she gets that parole or not. Because it's this year that she's slated to get the parole. Okay, if those of you caught the last broadcast, you know I showed you that. So that's something to watch because, see, if they let this monster out, we all need to know what this bitch is. You a child murderer. If you would kill your own kids, they let you out. I don't care how long you've been in there. You you can't be around nobody's kids. So that's where that's what my sentiments are on it. But we're going to continue to examine this because there's a lot of lessons to be learned from a lot of different angles we're going to cover over here tonight. Let's let it continue. By mid-1994, their marriage is in crisis and Susan files for divorce. Then a 911 call is received from this house just after 9 p.m. on Tuesday, October the 25th. The house is a quarter of a mile from the John D. Long Lake, north of Union. There's a lady that come up to our door, and uh, some guy jumped into a red light with her car with her two kids in it, and he took off. Susan claims her car has been stolen and her children abducted. The police track down David, and he races to the scene. Ironically, the tragedy will heal their broken marriage, albeit briefly. I walked up to the door, and Susan was standing there, and she just kind of collapsed in my arms. I had to, like, pick her up. I had to, like, pick her up and move her back on the couch. She was very distraught, very, you know, visibly upset. For nine days, Susan and David are headline news across America, pleading for the safe return of their children. I just feel in my heart that you're okay, but you got to take care of each other. But the police are suspicious. They question Susan every day. 
And then, on November the 3rd, 1994, in a dramatic turn of events, Susan Smith confesses to murdering her children and tells the police where their bodies can be found, at the bottom of the John D. Long Lake. Prosecutor Tommy Pope has just finished a case when he gets the call. I finished the prosecution of the case I had up here, and then actually we had left the courthouse and were um, kind of celebrating our victory, and uh, the, the phone rang, and uh, um, we had word that they, they had located the boys in the lake. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Union is in shock. Apologies about that, family. I meant to skip past that part. I meant to edit that part out of there, but we're going to keep examining this because, see, it, this gives me a chance to expound on something. I was going to wait until they uh, brought up something else, but I'll cover it now. You saw how her husband was saying that, you know, he had to pick her up. And you saw all the theatrics, all those, those fake crimes. And what kind of crime is that with no tears running down your face? And as you saw on the last broadcast, I showed you how the behavioral experts were examining how to catch her in a lie when somebody's lying about something like that. Because, again, I'm going to say it in this broadcast tonight. If something that horrific really happened to you, you would not even care about your appearance. Your heart would be towards the safe return of your children. That, that, that's not how people act when they're under genuine distress about their children. OK, so now what we have to look at is black folks. They have historically. And this is why I say they are the most demonic, deceptive, dangerous creatures on the planet. Because they can sit right next to, think about this. Let's really put this into context. She's sitting right next to her husband, child's father, and lying with a straight face. All them fake ass tears and everything. Just sit right there doing that. I showed y'all, and I should have put that in here tonight. I wish I would have thought to uh, find that. But y'all have seen this clip. I think I first saw it on TikTok or somewhere it was floating around where y'all seen the clip. Well, they have like this montage of white women. They was playing. I forgot the little challenge they called it, where it was a bunch of white women and they all pretend to cry and then they just turn it off just like that. See, this is why I go in so hard about all that damn and swirling and all that. People going to do what they want to do. But see, again, like I said in the last broadcast, you see the situ situation with Jonathan Majors. You saw what OJ went through. OK. Case after case after case. Well, even people outside of our lineage, the Christian Open Cellar, saw how he lost his life. Okay. The case that I'm going to be reviewing with uh, Shade Robinson. You know, you saw that. And she was only 19, for what I understand. But I'm, I'm going to tell you who I'm going to lay the blame of that on when I, when I do that broadcast because if somebody need to go in and call them out. And I'm definitely going, going to do that. And I'm not going to pull any punches when I do it. But this is what I'm saying, family. They weaponize their tears, and that's often deadly for us because they can be telling complete lies and their entire community will get riled up and go out searching for whoever they said did it that was black, even if they're full of it, okay? Even if there is no black prison, it puts a target on our backs, okay? So this is why there's no innocent thing. There's no small thing. And see, you got to look at the psychological makeup of a person that would be that demonic to do something. See, Let's put it in, in the context for something that all black people should be familiar with, especially your foundation, Black American Freeman. How many people in here saw the movie Juice? Hmm? Y'all remember the movie Juice? Tupac, Omar Elves, y'all remember that movie? I know that's a classic if you're a foundation of Black American Freeman over here. I know you remember that movie. Y'all know where I'm going. Remember that scene where Bishop came to old boy funeral? And he was the one that killed me. He's sitting there hugging his mom. Yeah. Let me tell you something. You keep that scene in your head and you multiply it times 10 when you're dealing with these alabaster white supremacist females. Okay. Because they are beyond even that. All right. They'll sit right there next to their spouses, lie to their families and children, claim one of us did something. Then there's no truth to it at all. But see, this is why I tell people, and I understand that some people listen to this, you might not be a person of faith. That's okay. 
But the Most High was definitely moving, and he made sure that she confessed that. She made sure he confessed that. Because you know? that that right there, man, when you doing things to kids, I don't care who you are, you lose all favor with the Most High. You better believe that. So we're going to continue to analyze this family. And like I said, if I catch any more of these little skips in it or whatever you, because I meant to edit that out, but we'll skip past that, and we're going to stay focused on the main Part of the matter here, because like I said, there's going to be several things that I'm going to point out, especially for back then, before we had a way to debunk a lot of things. Because see, you got to understand this for the young people that have grew up with the Internet in their lives all the time. They don't really know anything outside of this. They don't really they can't really fathom what it was like not to be able to fact check something instantly. OK, so we have to take that into account and have the patience to teach them these things and show them how, yes, this stuff that happened back then affects you right now today because these are the same people with the same mindset. Let it continue. And Susan Smith's Red Master is hauled from the John D. Long Lake with the bodies of Michael and Alex Smith still strapped in their car seats. Susan Smith has been arrested and will be charged with two counts of murder. So I immediately got in my car, left here and went to Union County and actually went out to the site um, at the lake where the boys were recovered. Pope arrives at the crime scene and begins to build his case against Susan Smith. The night that she ran to the house and reported that the children were missing and they called David, Channel 7 out of Spartanburg came and I had the raw footage from the, the video that night that they run in the blip on the, on the thing and it was the most interesting thing the lady's got the lights down, and she's explaining, okay, when we come on air, I'm going to ask you this and this and this. And David is there, and he's got the deer in the headlights look. We call, you know, he's just like a guy who's just lost his two kids. And Susan is kind of giggling to David, we're going to be on television. Now, did y'all see that, family? You know, let, let, let me take that back a bit because I want I want to I want to really focus on how that man was looking. We, we got to look at this. Hold on. Get that right there. Cause see. Now, take a look right here. OK, take take a good look at this. The difference between the two of them right here, this is it all. I wouldn't wish this on nobody. No parents should have to know what it's like to bury your children. It's supposed to be the other way around. That look on that man's face, that's genuine concern. That's how you could tell that he didn't have nothing to do with it. Because, look, I don't have kids. And I don't know what it's like to lose any. But I can empathize. And I think every black man or every man listening to the sound of my voice, no matter what race you are, you could understand this. That man is empty. He, he, he doesn't. Look, he's numb. You can tell by looking. The eyes are really the windows to the soul. That man don't know what to think. He's trying to figure out, okay, are my kids alive or what? He don't know what to think at all, all right? He's hoping against hope that his children would come home safe. Then he's trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to be consoling for my wife? And he probably didn't even notice this damn demon sitting up here happy. Look at her. Let's go to her. Look at her expression. Sitting here smiling and shit. I got a question for the, the women in this chat room that are mothers. Could you imagine yourself smiling if something happened to one of your babies, heaven, heaven forbid? Could you imagine yourself smiling? Hmm? How would you even be able to... See, this is like a person that's just going on about their regular life. And they say that I exaggerate when I call them the demons that they are. Oh, this is demonic right here. Are you looking at a damn demon? There's no normal human being that would be able to sit up here and smile and just carry on like everything is cool. Not, not any mother that loves their children that I know. Oh, no, there's no way. There is no way. So, see, what they're about to explain here with this, we're going to break down all of this. We're going to study body language, movement, and call all of this out. Because, see, for us, it's important for us to study these people and, and, and when they commit these egregious crimes like this, because we need to know about the threat that's around us. Yeah, I'm going to say it like it is. I'm going to see it like it is and see when it comes to a lot of the Emmanuel I chose. Okay. I'm going to go there. Okay. And even some of our own lineage 
And I don't need to call no names and get to talking about my white brothers and sisters and all of that. Okay, fool. You sit here and you ignore that what's in their community like this, because I'm not saying all of them are like that, but it's too damn many. Oh, yes, I'm going to say that. I'm not saying all white people are like that, but it's too damn many. And all we got to do is look at what they do to their people. My concern is for our people when they come around us, I'm always thinking this way because this is what was taught to me and history bears out that is wisdom. If they'll do these things to their own people, in this particular case, her own children, what you think they'll do to us and our children? See, that's how smart black people look at these types of situations. You understand? So that's the context that I'm coming at this from here tonight. I want y'all to look at this now because you see her, boy, she looked like she just won a damn sweepstakes or something. I, I, there's no trace of a distraught mother on her face at all. It, it, like I said, this is absolute disgusting. If it was up to me and I was responsible for the sentence, you already know what I would do. I'm like, yep, you're going to get what you gave your children. That, that would be justice for that. You don't need to be sitting around because I get it. Some people say, okay, she got to sit in there and live with what she did. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm more of an eye for an eye when it comes to that when you're killing kids. But we're going to let it continue, family. There's a lot more to analyze. Just lost his two kids. And Susan is kind of giggling to David. We're going to be on television. The funeral for Michael and Alex Smith takes place on November the 6th. They're buried in David Smith's family plot next to their uncle. Michael and Alex were the only reason for me to get up. And it's just like, it's hard to explain, but it's, it, it's really like a, a part of you dies. Something on the inside just looks like a pilot light goes out or just a light bulb slowly dims till it burns out. There's no life. You just, you feel lost. You, I mean, it's like you don't know what to do. The reason you got up every day is now gone. So what am I supposed to do now? Now, let's pause that because you heard what he just said. And as much as I hate that, that happened to his children. Black people have had to feel that countless times because of this demonic system of white supremacy that has taken our children from us. See, this is the only way that those in the dominant side society can even understand that it has to happen to them first. And then, most oftentimes, it happens to them at the hands of their own people. When they mocked the, the death of Tamir Rice, and some of them actually had the nerve to mock what happened to little Ayanna Jones. I could be here all night naming names. Just look at them on social media, st steady celebrating the death of black children. You don't ever see us doing that when we see something happen to somebody's child of any race. You don't see black folks celebrating that. See, this is why I keep saying that there's a stark difference between them. Because, see, let me go here before we let this continue. If you can draw yourself to celebrate the death of somebody's child, that means something is broken in you spiritually. You, you don't have, there's something in you that has no connection or attachment to humanity whatsoever. But, see, they're able to do this consistently when something happens to a black child. So I, I just had to point that out. But y'all going to see the rest of this because see a lot of people that are too young to remember this. They're hearing this information for the first time. I'm going to let this play and I want y'all to pay attention to what they're about to describe here next. On January the 16th, 1995, Susan Smith is taken to Union County Courthouse for arraignment. Right. Tommy Pope announces he'll pursue the maximum sentence. Death did I want an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? Absolutely. Yes, I did want the death penalty. A trial date is set. There's no doubt Susan Smith is guilty. She confessed to the crime. But to get the death penalty, Tommy Pope will still have to prove she committed murder with malice aforethought. Malice aforethought doesn't necessarily mean premeditation. It can simply mean that that any time before you strike the fatal blow or pull the trigger or drop the brake that you had a, a, a wicked spirit or malice toward the individuals. 
the murder trial of Susan Smith begins on July the 18th, 1995. As David Smith arrives at the courthouse, emotions are running high. The first day in court, when I saw her, I think it was anger all over again. Um, just uh, wanting to confront her. A lot of days during the trial, I, I wanted to kill her. Um, and it, it got it got so bad in my mind that I would be, you know, studying like where the officers of the court were at and how far away I was from her and, you know, plotting like, okay, I can be on top of her in about three seconds and it's going to take, I know that cop probably a good five seconds before he could reach me. All this stuff used to go through my head every day in court. Because I just, I wanted her to know what she had done to me. Now, I'm going to add something else to it. Because, see, I can understand. that That's absolutely normal. That's absolutely normal. But, see, I got to go here. I'm going to add something else to it. For those of you gathered here in this chat room, I'm going to go somewhere with this. Because this is very important. Family, let's just say that it was a black man that did that. Because we know there was no black man nowhere around that was completely fabricated. But let's just say it was a black man responsible there, or a black person. Y'all think that they would have just given them a life sentence? Or do you think that they would have actually go ahead and, and given a capital punishment sentence? Huh? We got to ask that question now. Because, see... This is something else about them. They really don't like to punish each other, even when they do things like killing their own kids. They really don't like to punish them like that. They don't. They had to do something because they know if they didn't and they know their own people, you heard what he said. He was going to take justice into his own hands, and I couldn't blame him for that. And see, I'm going to tell you the other thing that as a man, I know what I would have been thinking in that situation and on top of what he was he was thinking. Cause I would have did my best to get my hands on that bitch before this happened. I'm just going to be honest. But that would have left you the question, how did I not see that I procreated with this damn demon? There, there should have, I mean, no, every man in here probably understands me when I say that. You would have to be questioning yourself about how could I not see this in that person? How could you not see that type of evil? Because it, there had to be signs of it. You look. You cannot make me believe that there was not signs of it that he didn't overlook. It had to be because see, let's let's go here. To be honest with you, it said that they both it said that they both had affairs and what have you. But I mean, maybe that was something. I'm not justifying it, but maybe that was something trying to tell him, hey man, you need to leave this alone. I'm just saying we got to look at these things. So this is what I would say to any man, you any woman too. Let's, let's go both directions with it. Any man or woman, you better make sure you take your time and know who you're dealing with because there are monsters out here in this world that will do things like this. And as you see, this demon here will sit up there and be laughing and grinning. And as we know, like Brother Nightfall Drop pointed out in the chat room, she up there getting it on with the prison guards and stuff. And you see people that are out here free, other white folks, waiting on her to get parole if she happens to get it this year. Okay. So my admonition is take your time out here, ladies and gentlemen. You need to know who you're dealing with because you, the last thing on earth you want to be is in a situation where one of these damn monsters does something like this to your children. Let's let it continue. Prosecutor Pope intends to prove that Susan Smith is a monster who lied to her family, friends, and the nation about her crime. If he can convince the jury of this, she'll be the first woman since 1947 to face the electric chair in South Carolina. But I don't wake up going, woohoo, you know, today I get to try to kill somebody. I mean, I, you know, I'm, 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 I don't think you make your best prosecutor by doing that way. But, but by the same token, I truly believe in, in, in our system and in the laws. 
Pope's case is based on the theory that Susan Smith's affair with a wealthy local businessman, Tom Findlay, led her to become infatuated and willing to do anything to be with him. Tom Finley was a big fish in a small pond. You know, his family was well-to-do and owned the mill and, and, and financially probably as well off or more so than anybody in that town. Pope shows the jury this letter Findlay wrote to Susan. I think at some point he decided that, uh, you know, that the fun was over. And so I always said it was like a Dear Jane letter that he wrote to her and not, and he ended up in his letter basically saying she was a good girl, but they could never be together because of, uh, um, among other things, the children. One week after she received the letter, Susan Smith drove. Now, you heard the reasoning why she decided to kill her children. A man that she wanted to be with said that he couldn't be with her because of her kids. So instead of her saying, okay, well, I guess that this wasn't meant to be, this demonic bitch said, you know what? I can take care of that. Let me just go ahead and kill my kids. See, for me, there is no horror movie or anything in fiction that has come up in the mind of man that can be more terrifying than that because. You think about a woman that's capable of killing something that she grew inside of her for nine months at minimum. You think about that. Never mind the physical umbilical cord that's attached to that human child, but there's a spiritual one that's connected as well to a normal mother. So for this demon to even consider that, to even consider that, that lets you know that that's not a human being. That That is not. I have no problem saying that about anybody that commits that type of crime towards a child. Two children in her case. And the way you did it. There's no good way to do it. But that way, that's a slow. T Look at this picture on the screen. Two young kids in a car. You sent them into a lake. And you think about how this starts as this car starts to sink. The water is filling up in there and they crying and screaming, hollering for their mom, probably trying to, the oldest trying to figure out what did they do wrong, if anything, just terrified. And you put this in prison for life instead of like Brother Nightfall Drop said, fire up old Sparky. Yeah, yeah. And man, look, boy, y'all, I can't even go into detail about what the execution would have been if I did it. I'll tell you this much. It'll be more like a damn Saw movie if I had to call the execution. I'm gonna be on, or, or better yet, I'll, I would let the father decide what, what the execution need to be. That that's, that would be justice, in my opinion. But see, family, this is why I keep telling you, brothers, I, and I got to say it. I'm gonna make you mad, cause see, I'm probably gonna make some people mad when I do the Shadow Robinson broadcast. Cause I'm not no hold back on, on that either, cause somebody got to have the balls to say this stuff. When you choose to go over there and get you one of these Becky sources, it, just know you could be picking one of these. Because she's not a one-off. This is not some rare anomaly. They women do this all the time. And a lot of them get away with it, too. That's the thing. See, you think about it. One of the differences that I would say, and I, and I got to say this. I, I got to go here. One of the differences about most normal men, I'm going to say normal, because you got some wicked men out here to do these crazy things, too. But most normal men, we understand that when children come into play, you're supposed to live a life of sacrifice. It's not about what you want. It's about your kids. And see, you would think that both normal parents would want to see their kids grow and excel. You build their memories with your children, whatever their first accomplishments are, first words, first steps, things of this nature. That's supposed to do something to bond you further and closer to your child. You're supposed to envision things about that child's future growing up. But her? Oh, no, that was nowhere on her mind. She murdered her children for a man that said he didn't want nothing to do with her with children. You just let that sink in for a minute. No pun intended. I would not make a joke. But y'all just think about that for a minute. We're going to let this continue. Her children to the John D. Long Lake and drowned them. I think she really believed that if, if she could be 
um, free of David, free of the kids, then she would have this kind of fairy tale life with Tom. David Smith attends court every day, searching his memory for anything Susan said or did during the hunt for his boys that betrayed the horrific crime. The strangest conversation that I had with Susan during those nine days was one evening she made the comment if we get the boys back, and then she stopped, I mean, when we get the boys back, um, do you think we could be a family again? And I just thought that was a little odd because, you know, first she said, you know, if we get them back. Because I, in my heart, I never gave up hope that we wouldn't find them. On Thursday, July 20th, just two days after the trial began, the prosecution rests, and Susan Smith's defense begins. Her attorney, David Brooke, has hired Judy Clark, one of the nation's leading anti-death penalty attorneys, to assist him. They've no intention of having Susan testify. Instead, they'll paint a picture of her as an unstable, suicidal woman whose father killed himself when she was seven and whose stepfather sexually abused her at 16. Central to their case is the idea that Susan is a victim, not a killer. It's a story they fed to the media for months before the trial. Now, what they're about to do here absolutely nauseates me. Let, let, me, let me say something. I've said this for years. When it comes to crimes like this, when anybody commits this type of crime, they're not sick or mentally ill because you have to sit here and plan that out. Y'all know what I tell you. There's a difference between a mistake and a bad decision. I'll say it again for those that never heard me give that explanation. It should be self-explanatory, but I'll take the time to do it. A mistake is unforeseen occurrence. That can happen to anybody. A bad decision is a series of thoughts that leads to a choice. One word for that in this case, premeditation. You set up this bitch, and I'm going to call it what she is. This bitch set up thinking about this. Days in advance before she killed them kids. I guarantee you that. And I'm t I tend to agree with Nightfall Josh. She probably never wanted them kids in the first place. Hey, it was a lot of things that I know that her, her ex-husband there is wishing that he would have took his time and caught. While he was probably enamored by the way she, she looked or whatever. I know he kicking himself every day, even though the man has moved on. He's got you know, a new family from what I understand. Yeah, other children and everything, but that that right there, that'll never go away. He'll never be the same again. And see, for them to sit up here and try to act like, oh, she was a victim or whatever. What? How was this bitch a victim? But you know what? They finna explain it to us, fam. They finna explain how she was a victim. I, I want you to brace yourself for this, because this is going to be sickening. I'm going to let it play. She does not know what happened or why. She does not understand it. I will always give the defense tremendous credit for the job they did in this case because with the help of the media, they went from Susan the monster to Susan the victim during those months leading up to trial. Because Susan has confessed to murder, Brooke is left with only two ways for her to escape the electric chair. Plead not guilty by reason of insanity or plead guilty and prove Susan was temporarily mentally ill at the time she drowned the boys. Under our insanity, you need to think, you know, this desk is an elephant. Not I'm, not I'm sitting in a desk, but I'm not just sure where I'm at. In other words, it's a very strict standard of, of insanity. And so the fact that you stop for a stop sign, you know, shows a connection. You know legal right. Exactly. See? I'm glad that he said that because, see, a person that's not in their right frame of mind or saying you don't pay attention to the normal rules and regulations in society in any type of way. You're insane. You're not even capable of doing that. And this whole old world, you got to prove she was temporarily saying, no, no, that bitch wasn't. Because, see, she had the wherewithal to try to sit there and cover it up. That's another reason how you know somebody's not insane. An insane person isn't going to try to make up no alibi or keep up no elaborate rules. They just did what they did, and you caught them when they did it. That's that's really that's really what insanity is. If somebody does something like that, they waiting there. They're not trying to escape. 
nine times out of ten, because see, if you are trying to cover up something, you're trying to escape, you're not insane. You in your right frame of mind because you know what you did is wrong. See, but when they try, and I get it, that's his job as a defense attorney to do that, but that that's just sickening. In a case like this, nah, man. Like I said, man, she she deserved the death penalty. And I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna say it again. We should all be watching to see if they let this helper go on parole because it should have been life with no, without the possibility of parole. Why would she even be off of parole in the first place? You killing kids? I mean, if it's proven beyond a reasonable doubt that you did that, I mean, no doubt whatsoever, you killed children, you should never see the light of day again if they don't execute you. Never. You know, but hey, this is how they, this is how they do it in their so-called justice system. Let it continue. Brooke and Clark are left with only one strategy. They argue that Susan was not insane, but was depressed and suicidal in the weeks before the murders. She'd been drinking heavily and had had sex with four different men, including David, Tom Findlay, and even her stepfather. She'd also been diagnosed with dependent personality disorder. See how they try to throw in her sexual habits as if that made her insane? No, that didn't make her insane. That just made her a terrible thought. That's common alabaster behavior. That that's not insanity. That they do that all the time, especially the stepfathers and sometimes their fathers. So no, I ain't buying that one. A mental condition that explains why Susan craves affection. But not everyone buys it. Please remember who the real victims were in this case. And it's not Susan, that Michael and Alex, the, the two little boys who lost their life. Next, Brooke claims Susan actually wanted to kill herself, but got out of her car at the last minute when she became too frightened. Their theory became kind of a, it was a botched suicide. You know, but I noted uh, she wasn't wet when she showed up at the other house and she wasn't skinned up as if I really was going to roll myself down the ramp and then bail out the car. I mean, you would have had to, you know, get injured or dirty or something. In closing arguments, the defense tells the jury this is not a case of evil, but of sadness and despair. To Tommy Pope's shock, Brooke even convinces the judge to allow the jury to consider a lesser charge of manslaughter. Suddenly the judge decides when it goes to the jury that in addition to guilty and not guilty, he's going to also allow the jury to consider involuntary manslaughter, which was way off course for what we were aiming for. That's like a very minor charge, like a five-year charge. Despite the setback, Pope begins his impassioned closing argument, claiming Susan is a selfish, manipulative liar who killed her children so she could be with her lover. On Saturday, July the 22nd, the jury retires to consider its verdict. It takes them just two and a half hours. The jury goes with Pope. Their decision, guilty of two counts of murder. The same jury that has convicted Susan Smith of murder must now recommend whether or not she should die for her crimes. For maximum emotional impact, Tommy Pope first calls her husband David Smith to the witness stand. I remember I cried a great deal. Um, I was even told there wasn't a dry eye in the in the courtroom when I got done. I had to. Now I'm gonna pause this because while he's talking here, but see, I got to point out something. Because see, these are the children that she murdered, her own children, and those are his children there. The one thing that should have been done, and I understand that, you know, he lost his children there. But the one thing that should have been done that I never remember seeing during when this happened, there should have been an apology to the black community for blaming us. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going there. This is important because, see, that's been too many times that they've done that. And see, notice this. For the Tim Scotts and the Kamami Harris's that keep talking about America isn't a racist country. Okay. Well, if that's the case, even if this man didn't do it, which I would understand because he's so distraught over the loss of his children, I can understand that. Why didn't the police department say, you know what, we apologize to the African-American community 
or the black community for them her blaming this on you. See, they just kind of like, oh, just sweet down the road. She just blamed some black a black man in the black community. No big deal. No, it is a big deal with us. So again, I hate that happened to his kids, but they should have apologized to our community for that because it happens far too often. And when that happens, that that puts our people in danger for things that we did not do. Open, reopen some doors. Like memories of Michael and Alex that had already closed. You know, had already, like maybe I'd already like put on put in a shoebox and put on the shelf. And then when I had to testify, I had to open that box back up. Next, the prosecution plays its ace. To prove that Susan was lucid and had time to change her mind and rescue her children, Pope and his team reconstructed the crime scene. We did some testing because we wanted to know, just to find out what we could find out. How long did the car float? How long would the boys have suffered? You know, was there a chance for recovery? All these different things. Pope found an exact replica of Susan Smith's car, placed sandbags in the child seats where Michael and Alex would have been sitting, and took it out to the John D. Long Lake. This reenactment is to be the centerpiece of Pope's case. We mounted a camera on the back deck, had the car seats in there, we matched the weights and did everything scientific we needed to do. As, you, as the car would sink, you would see the water come up, and, and basically you knew in your mind's eye that the boys were strapped in these seats, and the car is now turned up, so you're now facing down. And ultimately, the, the water would go over, and it ultimately covered the camera. Um, when you watch it, you'll literally almost start feeling claustrophobic. You know, it'll, it'll take your breath away. Pope explains the car takes six minutes to sink. Ample time for Susan to get to the children and rescue them. But before the footage can be shown to the jury, Judge William Howard must decide if it's relevant and admissible. So the judge clears the jury, the press and the public from the courtroom for a private screening. We're watching it, the defense is watching it. It would literally, you could hear a pin drop in that courtroom and, and you just felt like that you were losing the oxygen. And over at Susan's table, I heard some noise over there. And she's giggling and like playing, writing notes and playing tic-tac-toe or something. Did you hear that family? Did you hear that? While they're showing that reenactment in that courtroom, this man said this demonic bitch was sitting over there giggling and playing tic-tac-toe. See, see, I'm going to say something, man. I got to be honest. I, I don't understand how her ex-husband was able to sit in that courtroom during that. I, I, I couldn't do it because if I would have saw that, I would have lost it. I would have lost it. I, I'm upset. I knew, sir. No, no. I, I couldn't be in there and you laughing about this and i'm over here man my heart is ripped out of my chest my spirit is crushed and you laughing about what you did to my babies no there, there's no way there there's no way. but that's what she did and that i'm gonna say it again that is not uncommon in the community i don't care who get offended at this this is why i don't want nothing to do with their women because we got to be honest, man, this is rare that you see something like this happen in our community. I'm not saying it never happens, but that's few and far in between. It's far more common with their women in their community. And I'm going to be honest, let's flip it on the other end. I got to bring this up because everybody remembers this wrestler. Remember Chris Benoit? Their men killed their whole families, too. So for me, I just know there's too many. And I'm going to go here. Because a lot of people may hear this part of the broadcast. Oh, GBS, that's just your personal biases and feelings. I'm like, no, first of all, I'm going off of history, but I'm going to tell you what else I'm going off of besides history. Look this up. Their own people verify this. Family, do you know which group of people on the planet have the highest susceptibility to mental illnesses and, you know, genetic disorders of the mind, psychological disorders? It's not us. 
It's them folks. Oh, don't take my word for it. Do, do your medical research on that. For me, combined with historical factors and those medical issues there, and then looking at the way they act in present day towards how they don't want to produce justice towards anything, especially when it comes to black people. And then when they keep trying to make excuses for their killers and murderers, they celebrate people like a cow ridden house, a Daniel Penny. Okay. That Daniel Penny, that bastard crept up behind Jordan Neely and choked the homeless man to death. There, there's just too much evil over there. I'm sorry. I get it. Not all of them are that way, but it's too damn many for me to take the chance to definitely be trying to get in any type of intimate situation with them. I can't do it. I'm in my right frame of mind and my spirit won't let me go that route. Now the rest of y'all probably some big bucks, bucks of betting to listen to this. Man, you just you tripping me. Okay. You, you going over there and then you'll be in this man's situation because see, there's more of her out there. I can't say that enough times. There's more of her out there. We're going to let this continue though. Cause I want y'all to hear more of how they're going to describe her demeanor here in this courtroom. Then she would kind of look up and, you know, they'd giggle some more, look up, but I mean, the video, she can see the video. The judge allows the video be admitted as evidence and orders the jury to return. So now everybody's sitting there. You can hear a pin drop in courtroom, same thing, but now the jury's in. I hear noise over there this time. Now she's crying. Hope is not permitted to present this disturbing contradiction as evidence. The jury will never know what happened while they were out of the courtroom. Susan's attorney, David Brooke, has the last word. Tells the jury that their judgment is sounder than Susan's and asks them to sentence her to life in prison. He looked at the jury in his closing arguments and said, um, who here among us can cast the first stone? Right out of the, that quote, right out of the Bible. I think it had a lot of weight with that jury being a small town and, you know, down here in the Bible Belt. At 3 p.m. on July 27th. I'm going to tell you right now, family, when he would have said that, who who among us can catch for, I'd be like, oh, oh, I got a whole bag of stones to toss at this bitch. Give me some cinder blocks. That, that's what, that really what should have been our punishment. The whole courtroom should have been given some cinder blocks. They'd be like, I'll show you who's going to cast the first stone. This demonically insane bitch, you child murdering piece of dog shit, you. That, that, that's what should have happened. Because, boy, I mean, man, see, I, like I said, there's just certain crimes that don't deserve any type of forgiveness whatsoever at all. They, they don't. Because, like I said, you're killing babies. You're doing things to elderly people, you know, mentally handicapped people, things of that nature. Why, why would you even want to keep something like that here? Okay. That there's no place for you amongst humanity, because if you can do that in your right frame of mind, then you don't belong amongst other normal human beings. You don't, you don't deserve to be sitting in jail and being fed and clothed out the taxpayer dollars either. That's why I'm all for capital punishment in a case where it's proven beyond all doubt that you did this. No. So, you know, I'm just saying, man, that's the situation there. See, you know what? I'm going to see it. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go here. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something, and they're not going to like this, but I, I need to be said. If the white supremacists were breaking to the jails back in the day to lynch our ancestors, how in the hell you don't go get this bitch right here today? Yeah, I said it. I, I said it. I mean, every word of it, and I'm not going to take it back. Yeah, that, that that's what it should be. But, hey, that's too much like right, though. Let's let it continue. Seventh. The jury is sent back out to decide whether Susan Smith should live or die. I felt strong about the case, but there were just enough X factors in it that, uh, and I've been in front of enough juries to know, you don't know till they come back. The 12 men and women of the jury return to the courtroom after once again, only two and a half hours. Their verdict is unanimous. <laughs> Susan Smith will not be executed. Well, I was disappointed. Um, I surely didn't believe that Michael Nylance got justice. But uh, at the same time, part of me felt that, well, maybe Susan, you know, didn't get the 
worse punishment because, you know, now she has to live every day with what she did. Judge William Howard sentences Susan to life in prison. She'll be eligible for parole in 30 years. When Judge Howard uh, told Susan and her attorney to approach the bench to receive her sentencing, it started to pour down rain over that courthouse. After he completed, the sun came right back out. And as Michael Lax's father, as uh, just a man's heart of hearts, I will go to my grave n knowing in my heart that that, to me, had to be the angels crying out from heaven. After the verdict, David speaks to the press. I'll never forget what Susan has done to me and my family, and I'll never forget Michael and Alex. But forgive, that's something I'm going to have to deal with, I guess, further on down the road. It took many years, but David finally found mercy in his heart. It took a lot of years, though. Um, I knew, I f part of me, I guess why I struggled with it, because I was so mad at her. So, you know, I had to forgive her because that's what God tells us to do. And I had to forgive her to be able to move on with my life. At first, Susan Smith had an entire nation glued to their TVs, praying for a happy ending. The Lord and, and myself both know the truth. I did not have anything to do with the abduction. Nine days later, the mother of those two missing children became the most hated woman in America. David Smith will never forget the crime or the trial, but he has managed to move on with his life. Now I have two more beautiful children. My daughter, Savannah, is 10. And my son, Nicholas, is eight. And, you know, they're my inspiration now. Um, they relighted that pilot light that went out when Michael and Alex died. And so everything's going real well. I have a good life now. And there you have it, family. You you heard the whole story now. If you're a young person listening to this, this is why we do not play games with these white supremacists. Because, again, for me, as tragic and as terrible as that crime was that happened to those two innocent babies, the bitch tried to blame it on a black man that did not have nothing to do with the crime and didn't exist. This is how demonically insane they are. So for all of them that are celebrating O.J. Simpson's death, talking about he's in hell, no, nah, this bitch right here should be in hell. That's who you should be wishing would go to hell. But see, speaking of that, oh, since they want to, you know, celebrate O.J.'s death, I'm going to do the younger people a favor because a lot of young people hit me up after the broadcast I did about O.J. Simpson. And just in case there's any other young people here, let me go ahead and put this article this broadcast in here for any younger person to check out i put it in here three times but speaking of the oj simpson uh, broadcast that i did i dug back in the crates on this one family because see the next one that i do here if y'all look in the live tab we're gonna give a deep dive and a historical lesson on who exactly the demonic race soldier mark Furman was oh oh that that broadcast i guarantee you even if you are already familiar with it. You're going to want to be here for that one because, yeah, we, we ain't going to pull no punches with that one. We not because the truth needs to be told all the way around. And since they want to sit here and continue to do what white supremacists do, which is I expect them to do, and I'm glad they're doing it so that our young ones can see what they are, we're going to go ahead and show them what Mark Furman was too. So that broadcast is going to be coming up and I'm going to be 
covering the Shade Robinson murder, okay, because again, I have to place the blame on more than just the white supremacists. There's another particular group of people that need to be held accountable for that too. And I'm going to get to that in that broadcast. So with that said, salute to everybody that joined us over here in attendance tonight. I hope everybody was able to learn something from it. And thank you to everyone that contributed to the broadcast. But let me let me leave you all on this note, family. This Children of the Chalk series, the reason that I do it is to remind these people and hold a mirror up to them and show them that no matter what they try to say about black people, they've done that and, and a thousand times worse. And I'm going to continue this series as long as need be here. There's no telling when it'll end, if it ends at all. OK, because there's so much to talk about. And I try to use these types of cases in history as teaching tools for our young ones, especially. So with that said, take care of yourselves. Love on your babies tonight, okay? Because I know this was a hard broadcast to get through for many people because we're compassionate people and we're close to humanity and the most high. So love on your babies, love on each other. Take care of yourselves. Salute to you, Black First. And I will see you all in future content. This is the 50th anniversary of hip hop and we still have a lot of discrepancies as far as the origins of hip hop, a lot of claims, who did what, who was the first this, who was the this and that and such and such. But at the end of the day, we need a definitive story, all right? And that story can only be told by the founders of this culture. Like everything was being driven and influenced by young, black, American culture. Like the slang, the style of dress, the initial uh, music that we chose. Look at uh, all the boroughs. You got, you know, money making Manhattan and money earning Mount Vernon and Crooklyn. The Bronx was the boogie down Bronx. We was partying up there. I am Coke LaRock, the first MC of hip hop. The first cat to pick the mic up. I introduced rapping to the turntables because when I came with it, nobody in the world was doing it. I'm right after Rudy Ray Moore. They want to come in the mix, they want to say, I was, we started. No, no you didn't, no you didn't, no you didn't. What can't be known as hip hop was solely an African American creation. What would you get out of some Jamaican toast? What is that? I've never heard of a rapper use a Jamaican toast or a Jamaican flu as a rhyme. I've never heard of it. And I don't know where that myth came from. My name is Legendary. Came Trixie from the Bronx, BX from the West Side. I am the first break dancer. And that narrative that hip hop has had three founding fathers, that's been rolling for the last almost 30 years, which isn't true. You don't have just three people who created hip hop. Hip hop was created by a number of different people. I am the grandfather, the godfather of the graffiti culture. I am the first element of hip hop. The roots of hip-hop being Jamaican, absolutely false. My name is MC Shah Rock. I am a founding member of the MC slash rap culture. Cassette tapes was the internet of our time. It just traveled around by hand. Well, I know for a fact that the B-Boy stand started from the gods, the five percenters that would be at the jams back in the days who were acting as security. If they get the real truth of how it all was created, then so many lies would not be able to be in existence.